You know, you have uh, no idea what a miracle it is uh, for me to stand here right now after hearing John and David and that incredible testimony from Louie. I just thought, I just could just go home. <laughs> and uh, that was just so amazing uh, to hear what God has done. And, you know, uh, John began this morning with telling us that we need to, you know, challenging us to be at the feet of Jesus. And David followed up with challenging us to put on the full armor of God in prayer every day. And uh, I looked at David and I thought, wow, you look like a special forces guy, you know, with uh, talking about armor. And then I looked at John and I thought, you've been sitting at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> and... <laughs> And then Louis sharing about the power of the gospel and uh, challenging us to share the gospel with our friends. And, and so God has kind of set up this message that I feel like he's given me for us this morning. And so let's begin by reading the text for our men's conference here, our men's gathering out of 1 Timothy 3, uh, verses, uh, or 2 Timothy 3. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I just want to make a couple of observations about the text this morning. And uh, before I get into my message, the first is the word profitable. The word profitable can be translated as beneficial. And in the Greek, it literally means to promote or enhance a, uh, your well-being. To enhance your well-being, to promote your well-being. And according to the American Heritage Dictionary, well-being is the state of being happy the state of being prosperous or healthy. It's a state of life which secures or tends towards happiness. So if you want to live a happy life, if you want to live a healthy life, a secure life, God's word can help you get there. It's all based in God's word. So how does it get you there? Well, Paul tells us. He says that God's word tells us the right way to believe, the right way to think, the right way to behave, and the right way to live. When he says it's profitable for doctrine, doctrine is the right way to believe. It's right believing. Reproof is right thinking. Uh, correction is right behavior. And instruction in righteousness is right living. And the Bible tells us everything we need to live right before God. And so you want to know, uh, you want to know what to believe about God uh, if that's what you want to do, study his word because he reveals himself to us through his word. In Luke chapter 20, verse 21, it says, Then they, speaking of the chief priests, asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. And so the Bible reveals who God is, and the Bible tells us how God works. You want to know how to think about life? Study his word, because God's word instructs us on how to think. In Philippians 4, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, which means nothing on CNN, um, if there's any <laughs> virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Think about these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. You want to know how to act and how to behave. Study his word because God reveals to us how we're to treat one another through his words. In Ephesians 4, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God 
by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. But let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And that's why Louis's testimony was so powerful because he did exactly that. He forgave someone that attempted to kill him the way that Jesus, who our sins put on the cross, in that sense, we killed Jesus, every single one of us, that Jesus forgave us. And he extended that same forgiveness. You want to know how to live. Study his word because God reveals to us how we are to live his life, live our lives through his word. In Micah 6, 8, it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And so God's word tells us the right way to believe, the right way to think, the right way to behave, and the right way to live. And if you notice, there's an order to this. You know, in David's message, he, he touched on this. Correct believing or right believing leads to right thinking. Right thinking leads to right behaving. And right behaving leads to right living. Those are the Christian rights, right? Those are the rights that you have as Christians. Everybody's saying, we demand our rights as Christians. Well, here's your right as a Christian. Believe right, think right, behave right, live right. And we do that through the word of God. And that's the pattern of scripture. Right believing leads to right living. And if what you believe doesn't change how you live, then either you don't believe it or you believe something about God that isn't true or you're being disobedient to the truth. It's gonna be one of those three things. Either you don't really believe it you're being disobedient to it, or what you believe about God is wrong. And that's why it's so important to study his word. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and that word know in the Greek is gnosko. It means to experience. You're gonna experience the truth when you experience Jesus, and the truth will make you free, John 8, 32. Jesus said, truth came through Jesus Christ. And so it's that experience of Jesus himself in our lives. And in John 17, 17, Jesus said, your word is true. So the word of God tells us what is true about us, what is true about the world, what is true about each other. And thus the word of God is the foundation for a healthy and a happy life. And so as I believe the God of the Bible, it leads to correct thinking which leads to correct behaving, which results in correct living, and that promotes a healthy sense of well-being. That brings life into my family. That brings life into my relationships. Jesus says, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, that word here, free, is actually a political term. It's a political term. It literally means to be released from the political control of this world. How many of you know that this world is seeking to control and dominate people? And the world will dominate your thinking. The world will dominate your behavior. The world will dominate how you live if you don't live according to the word of God. And so the world, uh, uh, Jesus said, that he has come to make us free from this political bondage of the world, that I am free now to be governed by God. I'm free to be governed by God. And that's what sets you apart. That's what sets me apart from the world, that we are not governed by the world system. We're not governed by world politics, that we are equipped by the Holy Spirit to be God's ambassadors, God's representatives in this world that we're not part of this kingdom, that we are part of another kingdom, a greater kingdom that has power over all the kingdoms of the world. 
And so, yes, as Christians, are we involved in politics? Absolutely. It's the politics of the kingdom of heaven. How does the politics of, kingdom of, of the kingdom of heaven work? It works like this. When someone's in bondage, you go in the power of Jesus with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and you set them free. If someone is in bondage to sickness, you go in the power of the Holy Spirit, in, in the power of Jesus, and you set them free from sickness through, by praying for them and seeing them healed. You know, we've seen many people healed in our church. We had a young boy that would come to our church and they would drive over two hours to get to our church and uh, for this young boy to be prayed for and he had a hole in his heart and God closed the hole in his heart. It was verified by a doctor. We had someone die in our church and uh, it, was, it wasn't during my preaching. Um, <laughs> But actually, a, a family in the hospital had called, and they were getting ready to pull the plug, and so they called one of our pastors to come and pray for them, and they went in to pray, and, and the next morning, the, the man walked out of the hospital completely healed. The power of God, being a representative, an ambassador of God, and that's what I want to look at, being equipped by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And uh, there's three relationships that every person can have with the Holy Spirit. And the first two are described in John chapter 14. So if you turn your Bibles to John chapter 14, we're going to look at um, verses 16 and 17. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Jesus says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He dwells with you and will be in you. In you, two words, with you, para, and the second word, in you, or the, it's, in the Greek, it's en or n. So Jesus says the Holy Spirit dwells with you. That's the Greek word para, and this is the relationship that every person has with the Holy Spirit. Every person alive has this relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's through this relationship that the Holy Spirit convicts or exposes the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment of sin because they do not believe in Jesus. That's what the scriptures say. And so unbelief is the basis of all sin. Every time you go out to sin and you know you're sinning, the Holy Spirit is warning you it's because of unbelief in your life. You have an area that's unsurrendered that you have not settled in your heart to say, I'm gonna trust the Lord in this area of my life. And so you go to do something to take care of that perceived need illegally against what God says to do. And so the Spirit reveals the true motivations of the heart. Are you motivated by unbelief or are you motivated by trust in Jesus? He says here, of, un of, uh, of, unri of righteousness, because I go to my Father and they see me no more. You know, the only way to see the Father is through Jesus, right? So that's the only way to come to the Father. I cannot come to the Father through my own righteousness, my own goodness. That's why no matter how hard I try to become a better person, that doesn't guarantee my place in heaven. There's only one way I can come to the Father, and that's through Jesus. I can't come to the Father through my own righteousness. And so the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will reveal the source of my, righteous, my righteousness. Am I coming in my self-righteousness? Am I presenting myself as self-righteous before God? Or am I standing in the righteousness of Jesus Christ? And I always love it when someone says, you know what, I don't deserve anything, but I received everything. You see, that's not standing in my righteousness, that's standing in the righteousness of God. And then he says, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, a judgment is a determination, it's a decision. 
And so God has already decided. And this judgment, this decision was rendered in Genesis 3.15 when God said Satan will bruise Jesus' heel, but Jesus will crush Satan's head. And so everything in this world is already judged. When we talk about God bring judgment on the world, the world is already judged. Death is a pretty heavy judgment, don't you think? Every person here is under the judgment of death. No one can escape it. The, the statistics for, jet, for death are just staggering. One out of every one person dies, <laughs> right? And so the Spirit reveals to you, whose side are you on? Who do you belong to? Do you belong to the Lord? Or do you belong to this world? And if you're not born again, then you're on the losing side. You're on the side that is under judgment. And so God doesn't judge anybody. He doesn't send people to hell. You're already judged. You're born under judgment. The only thing that sets you free, the only thing that liberates you, is when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ and you're born again. Jesus then says the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And this is the relationship that every born-again believer has with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. Paul says because the Spirit is living inside of me, I have a new mind. I have the mind of Christ. It is through this relationship that the Holy Spirit then guides me, teaches me, reveals the deep things of God to me. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians Chapter 2. Now, the natural man, the person that's in the world, does not receive the things of the Spirit. Paul says it's foolishness to them. They cannot understand it. They don't have the capacity to understand it. They don't have the ability to comprehend it. It doesn't make sense to them. Only the spiritual man who is born of the Spirit can know the mind of God because it is spiritually understood. It's spiritually discerned. And it is the foundation of the Christian life, once the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, that all of a sudden my life begins to change. My desires change. My will changes. God's word becomes alive to me. Worship begins to fill my heart with gratitude and praise. I have a friend from the Jesus movement that he said that the moment he received Jesus, a song came into his heart and it's never stopped. He wakes up with a song of praise. He goes to sleep with a song of praise. And praise is always in his heart. It's it's like a river that's just constantly flowing, this gratitude and praise to the Lord. Now, for most people, that's as far as they go in their walk with the Lord. God is in them. But there is a third relationship with the Holy Spirit that we can have. It's only for those who are born again. It's only for those who believe, and it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In John, or in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus said, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And Jesus said the purpose of the baptism with the Holy Spirit is to receive power to be witnesses. Power to be witnesses. And Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That word upon is epi, speaking of the third relationship, the epi relationship. And you shall be witnesses. That word witness is marti, uh, martis, and it's where we get the word martyr from. You'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so this third relationship that's described as the api or the upon relationship is a relationship of power. It's dunamis, which we get our word dynamite from. It's explosive, spiritual power, the kind of power that causes demons to tremble and darkness to flee. And this is the power that is available to every born-again believer. I mean, when you consider the 11 disciples after Jesus was crucified, what did they do? 
They were bold men of God. They went out and hid. They were terrified. This man that had performed miracles, that they saw him raise people from the dead, do incredible things, that they thought was going to conquer the Roman Empire and set himself up as the Messiah, the King of Israel, and he goes, gets himself killed. That's not a great plan for a takeover. And so they're terrified. They're afraid. They're in hiding. But what turned these 11 men who were in hiding and scared for their lives and turned them into bold street preachers who proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus Christ? It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John heal a lame, lame man. Peter preaches then about the resurrection of Jesus, and as a result, he and John are arrested. And then we get to Acts chapter 4, and Acts chapter 4, they're asked by the Jewish Supreme Court. They're, they're brought before the Jewish Supreme Court, and they ask them, by what power and by what name did you heal the lame man? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches the gospel to them, tells them about Jesus. We did it in the name of Jesus, whom you crucified, by the way. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and when they saw that the man was standing there healed, they realized that they had been with Jesus and could say nothing against them. They were speechless. Now, that's pretty amazing. But what I love is how they responded then to the situation. When they were released from custody, which I've told that many of you know about. Um, they were threatened. They were told not to talk about Jesus. And so they gathered together to pray, and in Acts chapter 4, if you want to turn there really quickly, Acts chapter 4, verse 28, we read this. Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They were faced with legal challenges for having preached the gospel, and when questioned about it, they said, hey, Lord, look at what they're doing to us, we need boldness, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak the word with boldness. R.A. Torrey, in his book, Why God Used D.L. Moody, writes this. He says, the secret of why God used D.L. Moody was that he had a very definite endowment with power from on high, a very clear and definite baptism with the Holy Ghost. Mr. Moody knew he had the baptism with the Holy Ghost. He had no doubt about it. In his early days, he was a great hustler. He had a tremendous desire to do something, but he had no real power. He worked very largely in the energy of the flesh. But there were two humble, free Methodist women who used to come over to his meetings in the YMCA. And these two women would come to Mr. Moody at the close of the, his meetings and say, we are praying for you. Now that irritated D.L. Moody. And so finally, Mr. Moody becomes somewhat nettled and said to them one night, why are you praying for me? Why don't you pray for the unsaved? And they replied, we are praying that you may get the power. And Mr. Moody did not know what that meant, but he got to thinking about it and then went to these women and said, I wish you would tell me what you mean. And they told him about the definite baptism with the Holy Ghost. And then he asked that he might pray with them and not they merely pray for him. And he not only prayed with them, but he also prayed alone. And not long after, one day on his way to England, he was walking up Wall Street in New York and in the midst of the bustle 
and hurry of that city, his prayer was answered. The power of God fell upon him as he walked up the street, and he had to hurry himself uh, off to a house of a friend and ask that he might have a room by himself. And in that room, he stayed alone for hours, and the Holy Ghost came upon him, filling his soul with such joy that at last he had to ask God to withhold his hand, lest he die on the spot from very joy. And he went out from that place with the power of the Holy Ghost upon him. And when he got to London, the power of God wrought through him mightily in North London, and hundreds were added to the church. You see, that is the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's, the purpose is not to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, although if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will operate in the gifts of the Spirit. It will naturally happen. But the purpose is to win souls for Christ. The purpose is to lead people to Jesus. It's to preach the gospel. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, the Lord added 3,000 to the church after the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. In Acts 2, 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In Acts 5, 14, believers were increasingly added to the Lord, both men and women. And in Acts eleven twenty four, 24, a great many people were added to the Lord. And so Jesus said, you will receive power to be witnesses to me. You will receive power to be witnesses to me. And there's something that this world needs today. More than anything is they need men that are filled with the Holy Spirit, that are baptized in the Holy Spirit, that are witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, that the government can't shut down, that culture can't shut down, that people can't shut down, but they're standing in the boldness of the power of the Spirit that's been poured upon them, and they're proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, not who's going to win the election, but the good news of who Jesus is, that he lives, that he rose from the dead, he forgives sins, and he has the power to change your life. Amen. That word witness in the Greek, I said it's the word martis, where we get our word martyr from. But it's a legal term. It refers to an eyewitness. Some of you know what that is. Someone who reports what they have seen or what has happened in a court of law. And so every person who has had an encounter with Jesus Christ, you are now an eyewitness of what God has done. You are a witness for him of how God's power can save and change a life. And now you're responsible for that testimony. You're responsible for that witness. And God says that you are to go out into all the world and share that witness with other people. But here's the thing. You cannot do it in your own power. You can't do it in your own strength. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. God says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to give you boldness to be a witness. Now, just as an aside, the Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost. There's another significant event in the Bible that occurs on Pentecost. It's when uh, the, the word of God was given to the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai in the book of uh, Exodus. And what's significant about it is that God, through the giving of his word, basically what he's saying is, I want to govern over my people. And he told Moses to prepare the people and have them gather around the mountain because I want to speak to them. But when God descended upon the mountain, all of a sudden, the people freaked out. That's what it says in the Hebrew. And it says, it says they stood afar off. But when you read it in the language, it says they ran for their lives. I mean, I think I would have been pretty terrified. So this cloud comes down, smoke and fire, and it's thundering, there's earthquakes, and they run for their lives. And Moses said, don't run. God is here to test you. And in the Hebrew, that word test means God is giving you an opportunity 
to grow in your relationship with him through a supernatural encounter with him because he wants to take you somewhere that you can't get on your own. That's the idea behind that word testing. Now fast forward that to the book of Acts. What is God doing when he pours out his Holy Spirit? All of a sudden you have, you have fire and the room is shaking, thunder, and the wind is blowing. And yet the Holy Spirit is upon every person. What is he saying? I want to govern over every person's heart, every person's life. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is all about. I'm no longer, uh, I'm no longer saying that I am the Lord of my life. I'm now receiving the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm not under my agenda. I don't live life the way that I think that I should do it. I'm now submitted and surrendered to the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, and I live for him. That's what happens at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I guarantee you, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you're busy being a witness for Jesus, you won't have time to get involved in things you shouldn't be involved in. You won't have time to look at things you shouldn't look at. You won't have time to have conversations that you shouldn't be involved in. Because the Holy Spirit will be directing you and guiding your life. This is where correct believing becomes correct living. You need to believe what God says your purpose is. That you are called to be his witness. And when you do, you will be the best wife or best husband. We're California. Um, <laughs> You will be the best husband your wife has ever seen because God's love will pour out through you to her by the power of the Holy Spirit. You will be the best friends to your buddies because you will lead them to Christ and change their eternal destiny. You will be the best dad to your kids because they will see a man on fire for God with purpose and a legacy that they can follow. And this is what the Lord put on my heart for us today. That there are many men here who are like David in the Bible. You should be in the battle. You should be in the battle for men's souls. God has put a call on your life. You are called to be his witnesses. But instead, you've been sitting at home, getting involved in things you shouldn't be involved in, getting caught up in controversies, Arguments over the politics of the world, talking like men. And your soul is dissatisfied. You're not experiencing the joy of the Lord. You're not happy with your life. You feel powerless to change, and it's because you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't have to preach on sin, because the Holy Spirit is already convicting your hearts. You already know what you shouldn't be doing. What you need is the power of God to be who he made you to be, and that is to be a witness for him. And so I want to invite you to come down, and we're going to pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. And as you come, you're making a declaration, because I want you to be clear on what you're agreeing to as you come down for prayer. You're saying to the Lord that I need the power of the Spirit. I need the power of the Spirit in my life. I want to live a life that's different than what I've been living. I want to step into that realm that's higher than what I've been living. I want to live a life that is supernatural with God. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, it is the most exciting life you will ever live. When I had the privilege of praying for someone who had died in our church and God raised them from the dead, let me tell you something, that was an exciting day. When we saw this lady's little boy healed of a heart defect and we received the report of the doctor, that was an exciting day. We've seen God do some miraculous things, but the greatest miracle that I never get over is when he saves a soul, when someone comes to Christ. 
You're saying as you walk forward, I'm turning away from the sins that I've been involved in. I'm leaving the past behind. I'm making a fresh start with Jesus and I'm gonna step into my purpose to be a witness for him. And so we're gonna invite the worship team to come up and as they come up and begin to play, I'm gonna invite you to come down and we're gonna pray for you to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And if there's those that are available to pray as well, you come down and be prepared to pray for these men that are designed to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One thing I will say about D.L. Moody is that he said afterwards, I mean, he was very successful as an evangelist before he was baptized in the Spirit. But afterwards, he said, you know, I didn't change anything. I preached the same messages. I did everything I did before. The only difference was instead of hundreds of people coming to Christ, thousands of people were coming to Christ. It brought a different dynamic. As I've been ministering, after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, having received prayer, I led worship the same way I'd always have. I taught the same way I always had. But the only difference is as I would lead worship now, I would watch people visibly experience the presence of God. There was a sense of God that I wasn't aware of before. There was a power moving. People were weeping and coming to Christ without us saying a word. We had a lady come to our church, and she had never been to church before. She brought a book with her uh, because she saw people going to church with a book. And so she thought, I got to bring a book to church. And it was a Christian book. It, the, it was the power of a praying woman. And as we began to worship, she just wept the whole time. And before I could give the invitation, she stood up and said, I want Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that what you want? Or do you want to keep working in the power of your own flesh, the power of your own strength? And so we're going to sing. And as we sing, and as I said, you're making the decision, a declaration. I need the Spirit. I'm turning away from my sin. I'm leaving my past behind. I'm making a fresh start with Jesus today, and I'm stepping into my purpose to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your word, Lord, and I pray for each of these men, Lord, as, we are, um, as we're closing this conference, Lord, that this would be a dedication for them, that they're making a commitment to you. I want the power of the Spirit to be a witness for you to be a bold witness for you, to proclaim the good news of Jesus, that our sins are forgiven, that we have a future in heaven, that Jesus is alive and that he is present and with us here even now in this room. And so, Lord, draw those by your spirit that you desire to pour yourself upon in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you, you come. You come right now.
this is what I want you to do. I want you to lift up your hands to the Lord. Because he's going to give you a gift. This is a gift that he loves to give. He loves to pour out his Holy Spirit. Lord, receive, but bless them with your Holy Spirit even now. And so just receive the Spirit. Just receive it. That's right. That's right. Just receive it. He's all he's he's moving already. Receive the Spirit. Some of you, he's just cleansing out the junk. He's just cleansing out that. Those tears that you're crying right now, that's the Holy Spirit. Just cleansing out the junk, cleansing out the filth, just cleansing out all of the stuff that's been keeping you held back. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. with your words. Lord, let the overflow of their heart, the goodness of God, the thanksgiving that's in their heart because of all that you've done for them, that their sins are forgiven, that they are your sons, that they belong to you. Let the joy of that begin to overflow out of their mouth. Lord, let it be unrestrained and anoint them with boldness to proclaim that message of peace God loves this world, that he gave everything, died on a cross, that this world could be forgiven. And the Lord, anoint them with your power. Anoint them with your power, Lord. Dunamis power, dynamite power, Lord. Whatever they need, give it to them. Boldness. Reveal things to them that they couldn't know. Show them things that are in the hearts of those that they're speaking to, Lord. Give them eyes to see. Give them ears that are open and listening to your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You're so good. in their mind, let that switch be turned, Lord, that they're no longer identified by your past. You're not identified by your past. You're identified as a follower of Jesus. You belong to him. You're not identified by your desires or by your sin. You're identified by Jesus. And he says you're accepted in the beloved. You belong to him.
Lord, release your joy. Release your joy, Lord. The joy of the Lord, that is our strength. Release joy in them, Lord. Inexpressible and full of glory. The joy of God. know that God is not bummed out that God is full of joy when he looks at the world he sees joy because he sees salvation being poured out he sees freedom being poured out he sees chains being broken he sees sins being forgiven he sees lives being changed let the joy of the Lord just fill you
You're not a God who tricks us. You said that if we ask for your spirit, you wouldn't give us a rock or a serpent or you would give us what we ask for. And so I, I believe and by faith we receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And let me tell you what's going to happen now. All of a sudden, it may not happen today, it might not happen tomorrow, but as the time goes on, as you begin to read the Word of God, it's just, just going to jump out at you. It's going to come alive to you. And all of a sudden, you're going to look around you, and you're going to see people differently. As we've heard in, in the testimonies that we, and, the, and the messages that we've listened to, you're going to see people differently. All of a sudden, you're not going to look at them through judgment when they cut you off. That won't be your first reaction. You'll look at them with compassion. And you say, after I get them back, then I'm going to pray for them. No. <laughs> You're going to see people through the lens of compassion. God's going to begin to show you things about their life that you never saw before. God's going to show you things about your life that you never knew before. And he's going to reveal himself to you. And you're going to get to experience the real God of the Bible. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who walked this earth, Jesus. He's going to reveal himself to you. And your life all of a sudden is... You may not get the boldness today, but all of a sudden you're just going to feel like, I need to go share with that person. I need to go talk to that person. I need to, I need to pray for that person. And you'll find yourself walking up to people and just say, hey, can I pray for you? And they're going to look at you and go, why? And you're just, I just feel I should pray for you. And you're going to pray for them, and they're going to look at you and say, how did you know that prayer you just prayed over me? How did you know to pray for them? And you're going to realize, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just spoke to me. And then you're going to go, wow, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. And your heart's going to be filled with joy. And then you're going to want to do it again. And then you're going to become a Jesus freak. <laughs> and then people are going to have to hold you back because you're like too freaky. <laughs> you see, that's how the walk of the Spirit is. You've just received the baptism of the Spirit. And now go, now go in His power as you go forth from this place. Go in his power and see how God begins to use you. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.